Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Welcome to the channel if you're new here. My name is Death by Pony and today we're going right back into Lake of Voices. So without further ado, let's hop in. The shoreline is dangerous. Whatever you saw could not be worth the risk. Lou actually laughed, a sudden sound that as that's as close to snickering as it is to sputtering. Watching a Nyx drag itself across the shore in the middle of the day would be worth the danger in my opinion. I give him a humorous, uh, reprimanding look. I feel vaguely like I have used this face to dissuade pets and young children from behaving poorly in the past. I was only joking. Thankfully, it seems to work on grown men as well. I hope he is telling the truth. For someone so nervous, he can be quite reckless. I'm still going, though. Don't worry. I'll be careful. We talked about this. He gives me a self-effacing, lopsided smile. You said you didn't want to make me watch out for you. I'll be back soon. You won't even notice. I sigh. Part of me wants to keep lecturing him on how serious this is. I just want him to be safe, but I fear I do not have the words to convey that without making the situation worse. Fine. I will come. Lou brightens. Of course you can come. I'd enjoy that. I get the feeling he was hoping I would say that. It's not as though I don't want to be around him. That's the farthest thing from it. It's the activity itself that's the problem. Despite my reservations, we head to the beach. Lou strides easily across the sand, his bare feet sinking down into the loose grain as he stretches his arms contentedly. It is so much nicer out here. I make sure to stay close behind him, just in case. I would not want him to go off in, on his own. Lou notices my position out of the corner of his eye. He isn't so distracted that he's forgotten I'm here, it seems. He takes a wide step back, so we are side by side instead. I can't help but be surprised by his assertiveness, and it makes me grin, ner grin nervously. You know what I mean, right? Yes. The shore has its positives. I find it hard to navigate the loose sand in my boots, but Lou has little trouble here. There is only a few ragged bandages wrapped around his bare feet. I have to wonder how he's been thus far. The forest floor is rock and full of thorns. I clandestly check for any signs of bleeding. Thankfully, there are no traces of it. It also does not escape me that losing one's shoes is uncommon occurrence. They must have been stolen, or he did not have any to begin with. Hmm... Between my swirling thoughts and Lou's quiet self-assurance, we have walked in silence for a bit. This should be a good chance to ask questions about his life, where he comes from, what he does for work, if he has any other family. However, I cannot help but assume he would shrink away from such attention. Lou catches my gaze and inclines his head, a whisper of a smirk on his lips. Is there anything on your mind? Something you'd like to ask me, maybe? Oh! Yes, I'm surprised you brought attention to it. Lou snickers in self-aware sort of way. When you're as suspicious as I am, it's pretty easy to guess that people will have questions. I smile faintly. His openness is certainly appreciated. But the look fades quickly as it appeared. I turn away. I think I've asked you enough questions. Lou's expressions sink into melancholy. He holds my eyes in his own tightly locked and refusing to let go. Then he speaks unabided. I've done odd jobs most of my life. The only title you could say I've had is Messenger Boy. He hangs his head in embarrassment over his achievements and being, uh, begins to drift further away. That is nothing to be ashamed of. Information is meaningless if it is not with those who can use it. There are far less honorable ways of making a living in this world. I can think of some, too. Some that I've done. His words are mumbled, so it takes a moment for them to sink in. I'm not sure what to say, so I settle on closing some of the distance between us in an attempt to console him. Admittedly, I expected as much. His jitterness and defensive posture are typical of a petty criminal. I imagine he's had a tough life. The warmth between us melts, the dark mood that was beginning to form, a teasingly crooked smile 
looms on Lou's face as he relaxes again. Thank you. I didn't say anything. That's what I'm grateful for. At that, I'm able to chuckle and give a bent grin in return. It is no trouble. Lou turns his head away bashfully and lifts his hand steadily, inching in towards me. My pulse starts to race. He lets it drop before he touches me. It is relief as well as disappointment. Once again, silence falls between us. Suddenly, Lou begins running forwards. There is nothing ahead of us. I'm completely caught off guard and left momentarily dumbfounded. I shout after him to come back, concern rising in my chest. He keeps up the pace, but turns his head back to look at me, almost as if he's enjoying this. After a short sprint, he comes to a stop. As I reach him, he bends down and carefully picks something up off the sand. It's a strange, beautiful shell. Isn't it amazing? I wonder if other lakes have shells like this. I'm not able to stop myself from sighing. I... Don't know. Is that what you were expecting to find? It is. I like shells. The world is so dreary. Any flowers that bloom will wither and die in days without attention. I can't find a way to appreciate such fleeting things. It's only sad. As he speaks, his voice descends into despair, dropping so low it almost doesn't make it out what he says. I cannot think why this shell is impacting him so profoundly, but I want to comfort him somehow regardless of if I can fully comprehend him. Shells are beautiful and they can persevere. That is something I respect. It is good you were able to find what you were searching for. I think so too. He lets himself remain lost in the moment for a second longer, then gently offering his meaningful shell to me. Why don't you keep it? It can be a reminder of me. Ugh, oh, Lou. I have no idea on what to say. Those words seem so harmless and yet foreboding. Despite my silence, he continues to hold the shell out for me to take. Cautiously, I reach up to accept the gift, afraid what a wrong move could somehow hurt the shell or even him when I have it. Lou places both his hands over my hand and the shell. Thank you for coming with me. He continues to make it difficult to speak. It takes some effort to hide the bashfulness in my voice. It was no trouble, Lou. Really. Thank you for this. However, even if you didn't give it to me, I would not forget you. He looks happier than I've ever seen him as he presses my hands more tightly. I'm so glad I met you. Are you going to tell me you love me? Likewise. I'm happy we crossed paths. I hope... That will never change. If you think of me from time to time, it would make this all worthwhile. I'm glad. Even if for a more generous view of this than I would give, I relish his statement, who is finally showing some optimism towards life. I still am unsure why Lou came here to begin with, but it eases my mind to think that he may not have to regret the choice. Lou pulls away, locking the door, barely peeking inside. We can head back to the forest now. Right. That is for the best since we still need to rest before sundown. Do I look so fragile? I'm not impressed with his attempt at humor and look squarely at him as I speak, my voice completely deadpan. Anyone would have trouble with no shoes. I figured someone like you would say I needed to toughen up. I shake my head fondly. His elusive way of speaking has grown on me some. Come on, we should go. Ah, hearts were eased with someone special. Together we return to the woods in what feels like no time into the clearing. Margaret is already there waiting for us. She greets us with a smile. Hello, I suppose we all had the same idea of coming here a bit early. Then three of us quietly wait for the guide's arrival, occasionally chatting with one another as we rest. The sky turns orange as sunset comes upon us. As the color seems to drain from the world, being consumed by the fog, the guide makes his appearance. Lou avoids eye contact with him. It's almost time. 
I nod and feel myself grow tense. We truly are about to return to those bridges. All of us with wait in an uncomfortable silence until night falls. We silently stand as one, forming a vigil of sorts. Our remaining lanterns illuminate the dark, prepared for tonight's journey. And yet the way forward does not appear. The bridges haven't risen from the depths. I glance to my side. The guy doesn't look at all pleased. The corner of his mouth have harsh bent as uh, he briefly loses himself to heavy thoughts. We must go to the shore. He doesn't offer an explanation for why. Instead, he goes on without us. I follow after the guide, my forehead creasing with swelling worry. Behind me, I hear Margaret and Lou unsure footsteps. The four of us press onto the shore. The dark water laps at the edges of the sand, and as expected, the maze is still hidden beneath the surface. The guide grips his staff tighter. Still, his knuckles turn ghostly white as he sucks in a breath of air. He's about to speak, but hesitates. We all stare at him expectantly. After a moment more, the guide is fed up with waiting. The bridges are late. If they don't arrive as soon as darkness falls, there's no telling exactly how long it will be before they do. Lou doesn't say anything, opting to stare at the ground with an obscured emotion expression. Do you believe we will have enough time to cross? Time is by far the least of our worries. On the bridges we are constantly moving, which makes it easier to avoid the prowlers. However, this island does not offer that luxury. We're trapped here. My body goes ridges as his words sink in. More importantly, the bridges are raised above the waters. Nixie have difficulties pulling themselves up onto the bridges. The soft sloping of the shore will allow far more prowlers to drag themselves towards us. Ooh, this is not sounding good for us. Not all will be as dangerous as the ones we've encountered thus far. However, we could easily be overwhelmed. A pit forms deep in my stomach. I stare at him aghast. I had no idea the situation was that dire. I glance from the waterline to the trees. What am I looking for? I don't know. A sign of what might be to come, perhaps. Margaret moves into discussion. Her mood is rapidly declining as well. Then what should we do? We shouldn't stay on the shore if the monsters could be coming towards us at any moment. The guy closes his eyes and suddenly looks very worn down. Staying in the center of the island is the safest option. However, there's the risk that we may not be able to reach the bridges when they do rise. Prowlers could have taken full control of the shore by then. Remaining here with our lanterns will ensure the prowlers cannot move freely. My brows involuntarily knit together. I do not like the sound of taking additional risk in an area that is already so dangerous, but our options are thin. I will not be kept on this island for another day, so the shore is where I will be. You may wait at the edge of the forest, or even at the center of the island if you fear being attacked. If the prowlers come between us and you fail to make it to the bridges, I will leave you behind. The guide has made his decision and we must make ours. If you were staying by the shore, perhaps I could be positioned somewhat further back from you. And then the others could stay further back still. That would keep us safer without having any major gaps of darkness between us and the shore. I'd say that's likely our best option. And we don't have time to come up with any other way regardless. Fine. Settled on the matter, the three of us begin to move away from the guide. He pays little attention to us, instead silently fixing his eyes on the water. I take my place in the middle of the shore, while Margaret and Lou hover closer to the island's core on the line between dirt and sand. After getting a sense of where they are, I turn my gaze ahead. At first, I am being think I'm being fooled by the fog. There are several white dots playing along the edge of the water dark globes beginning to surface. I see them for what they are. Eyes. So many white dribbling eyes gleaming sharply against their pitch black bodies as the Nixie bob up and down. The surface and they surface and disappear in a loop. Each time more sets of eyes closer surveying us more intently. Then they cackle. The sound is atrocious gurgling. Then they turn high pitch as they seem to take full stock of us lights in their eyes somehow seem brighter as the first of the Nixie dig their claws into the sand and begin dragging themselves upon the shore. I plant my feet firmer. 
The shrill shriek of Pierce in the air accompanied by the telltale hiss. I whip my head back towards the sound, only to be greeted by coral black darkness. I cry out, despite and desperately into the void where Margaret and Lou stood. What happened? There's silence. Then the best sound possible. Margaret's voice replies, albeit shakily. There was a prowler in the woods. I didn't notice it until it was already too close to me. I dropped my lantern when I saw it. The light was enough to drive it away, but now it's gone. Shattered. I serve my head back to make sure the shore is still clear before I sprint over to release them from the darkness with my own light. Margaret stares down at the ground dejectedly when I arrive. Lou stands nearby. He avoids eye contact by awkwardly looking away as I approach the two closer. We can make a small fire for light. Margaret stiffens loudly. That may work for now, but what will we do once we're back on the bridges? We will manage. I speak firmly, trying to assure her. I can't even guess how effective the attempt was. Lou, please, clear some space while I gather kindling. Lou looks startled and suddenly being addressed, but quickly nods and gets to work, pushing away the leaves on a small patch of dirt. Margaret moves to help him, though she still looks terribly upset. I feel awful. It wasn't her fault. We dig a few inches down in the sandy soil before making an edge with rocks to stop fire from giving us repeat of last night. I layer the fuel quickly and light a match at the base of the pit. Margaret strokes the fire with Lou looking on. The grass ignites easily and shares the area with enough light to keep anything else that may be lurking in the forest at bay. I release a discreet sigh when we are truly lucky no one was injured or lost during this ordeal. I keep that thought to myself, however, hearing it would only make Margaret feel worse. You should go back to your position, Kika. It will all be for nothing if we can't make it onto the bridges in the first place. Right. I force myself to sound bold. We're going to get through this. Margaret attempts to smile at me. Lou views her empty expression for a moment before turning to move towards a nearby tree. He easily scales it. Absolutely puzzled, Margaret and I watch each movement as he lifts himself into the branch. I figured there's not much of a chance any Nixie will get a hold of me here. They won't climb. His voice is lighthearted with an easy, easy, easy confidence. Well, I won't bother trying to argue with that logic. Margaret has shaken off some of her sorrow, being in a better mood now. I smile to myself. I'd like to believe what Lou, that Lou true, will truly be safe from those predatory creatures this way. With the two of them doing as well as they can, I cautiously back up to my original position. I turn my focus to the shore. As we feared, this is becoming a pressing situation. More prowlers rose from the water while my attention was on those two. They've surrounded the guide on both sides. The only way to gain distance from them would be to delve further into the island, yet the guide shows no sign of giving up his position. He remains where he is, resolving to keep all the monsters near him in his sight. I grow more unnerved the longer I watch this. The guide seems impervious to the danger of sinless. This is the first case where I can't tell whether he will continue to be fine, as always, or not. It's a distressing notion. As they creep Ever closer, I can't stay silent any longer. Your safety is most important. Consider retreating. He doesn't face me, but replies. I cannot do that. Nixie recognized signs of weakness. Backing away will only increase the odds of them attacking. I grip my lantern tighter as I swallow hard. What can I do? As if to answer my own question, as though whispering into my mind, I look down at the lantern in my hand. I could throw it, as long as I do not let it go too far down the shore it doesn't seem plausible that Nixie could take it but if I do lose the lantern especially after Margaret lost hers only moments ago then throw the lantern I nod firmly to myself set on the decision I've seen the guide perform the move right in front of me I know it isn't an impossible feat I know something has to be done I inch my way over to the uh, most advanced group of Nixie they drift slowly as they attempt to get behind the guide I am of no concern to them, at least not for the time being. The guide spots me and we make eye contact for a moment. He doesn't say anything and abruptly fixes his gaze somewhere else. He gives me the impression that he's aware of what I'm planning on doing. He ignores me because he doesn't want the Knicks to recognize a combat threat. I steady my arm and assume a strong stance. I stop for 
a heartbeat to take a deep breath. Then I jump forward a small way to toss my lantern towards the group of Nixie on the guide's right side. They are all caught completely off guard, practically wheezing as I scatter to dive back to the depths below. Not even attempt to steal the lantern. This is a great relief. The guide seizes his moment to swing his staff at the group of Nixie on his left. Light edging close to them combined with the general chaos serves the creatures enough to frighten them. The left group joins the right in retreat. The guide observes the water line, making certain that they have all crawled back into the water and then releasing a small sigh. He walks over to retrieve my lantern off the sand where it landed, keeping his eyes fixed steadily behind him. Tentatively, I take a few steps towards him and extend my arm forward, offering my lantern back to me. I've never gotten so close to the guide before. He hasn't allowed it. Being in his presence this way feels unclear. I don't have the words to describe what and what it turns inside of me. His eyes are expectant and patient, and I waste no time. I move to accept it, but I flinch before I can grasp What's it. What's wrong? His face hardens, scrutinizing an unexpected reaction. I banish whatever expression was on my face and take hold of what's mine. It is nothing. He lets it go, so it does not make any attempt to leave. I do not believe it is because he is worried about leaving me in the darkness. He still suspects something is wrong. The guide watches closely as I set the lantern aflame once more. Its light uh, gently washes over me and I smile at the sight. This tool I hold is of the exceedingly few comforts one can have in Sinlos. I do not wish to part with it again. <sighs> he is still here and I begin to worry. The guide intends to admonish me for what I've done. I may have let uh, emotions show on my face again because he starts to speak. Keeping a hold of your light is crucial. However, if you took no risk, your only way across could have been lost. It wasn't an empty self-sacrifice. In your position, neither option was correct. Neither was wrong. Our in, in ma, enigmatic lead nods, and upon finishing up his thought, he returns to his original place. I stare flabbergasted at the guide's back. By chance, I was put in circumstances that allowed our values to align. But never would I have expected him to acknowledge that I made an acceptable decision. I stopped myself from getting further distracted. Instead, I glanced down at my light and realized the glow looks different. I wince. There's a large crack uh, wickedly curving up the back. I'm thankful that it still works. I fear that it would not hold out until morning. I look for lonely at the fragile glass surrounding the simple flame. In a way, it this event has forcefully reminded me of how fragile my own life is. One slip-up could mean the end of everything. Regardless, nothing can be done presently. We have got enough to worry about. As it is, I cannot let this consume me. We will continue to resist against this lake. After an untold period of time, the water begins to stir. There's unusual gurgling, a sound I never thought I would be relieved to hear. Slowly, creakily, the bridges make their nightly appearance. Sinless is overwhelmingly cruel environment. The island has felt like a safe haven such a short time ago, but that had been twisted to the point where I'm grateful for the chance to return to the maze, and we may not even reach that. More Nixie are breaching the water and wretch themselves onto the sand. The guide signals We have to, to leave! Thanks to his position on the shore, the guide is able to board the bridge without confrontation. For the rest of us, however, Nixie begin to crowd the opening. It appears they want to get on themselves. We have desperately little time before we cut off from the guide. I t look at my lantern. Will this light alone be enough to cause them to disperse? I hope so. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and if you did, you hit like. That way I know you're enjoying the videos and making sure to subscribe. That way YouTube brings you back here to see what's next. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Have a good day, and I'll see y'all next time. Bye.